All right, I'll just come out and say it. I reckon Dixie's Double Trouble is easily the best in the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. Flame away. After playing Diddy's Conquest a few weeks back, I had a fair few people disagree with me. It's the best ever, they were claiming. But when I asked why, the answer was generally just because it's good. Well, now I'm going to give you five solid reasons why I think the third game is the best. Feel free to disagree if you want. Number one, the graphics. Easily the best, don't think anyone could argue that. The use of colour and shading is at a whole new level. The characters clearly have more frames of animation. And uh, colour, brightness. After the dinge fest of the second game, look how vibrant it looks. Sure, it's got dark levels as well, but Rare went nuts with the paintbrush this time and the game looks stunning. Number two, the main characters. Dixie's still got her helicopter spin, which is awesome, but Kitty Kong, apart from his comical appearance, is a much more differentiated character than Diddy was. He holds his barrels in front of him like Diddy, and he has a rolling jump like Diddy, but he's big like Donkey, so he's got the big crushing factor. In this game, there's also two different buddy throws, depending on which character you're using. Kitty can throw Dixie up high, but Dixie can use Kitty to crush things. It feels much more balanced, and there's moments where you definitely prefer to use one over the other. Number three, the variety. The previous games had some clever gameplay twists, no doubt about it, but in part three, every level has its own gimmick, making it stand out from all of the other levels. There's, for example, the low gravity level, or the multiple animal levels, or this lightning level, trickier than it would first appear, or the rope climbing level, or the level where left and right are reversed. Ugh, that messes with my brain. Basically, there's something new to play around with every time you enter a new area, and it's great. Number four, it's more of an open world. Rare seemed to take a bit of a cue from Super Mario World here. Even though the game is still relatively linear, you're given much more choice about where you want to go, and there's even some light RPG elements with all of the bear characters spotted throughout the game. You also upgrade your jet ski to reach new places, find hidden caves. The world's just much more open, which I really like. And number five, the difficulty level is perfect. Whereas the first game felt a bit too easy, and the second game felt a bit too hard, this game feels just right. Hmm. I'm sensing a continued bear theme going on here. Whatever. I just find this game feels much more like a complete package. Almost everything is brand new, there's very few sprites recycled from the previous games. Whereas the second game felt like a kind of update, this feels like something original and unique, while still having the flavour of the other two. The new setting's nice as well. We're no longer in the tropical jungles of the first game, or the piratey island of the second. This time Dixie and Kitty are visiting a new Kong country, which is far more northern hemisphere-ish. Perhaps Canadian or European? Not sure. Anyway, the snow-capped mountains, lush forests, and bears. The new villain is a mysterious robot called Chaos. Hmm, but yeah, it turns out K. Rule is behind it all again anyway. This time he's calling himself Baron von Rulenstein. He's clocking up more aliases than Dr. Wily. One thing that probably went against this game's favour is that it was released about the same time as the Nintendo 64. In America it came out a couple of months later than the new system, in Australia it was a few months before. Either way, it seems a lot of people had already moved on. I've got to say, I was super excited when I first realised that Wrinkly Kong here is playing on a Nintendo 64 on the Super Nintendo. How cool a little easter egg is that? There's not much more I can say. I reckon this game is great, and I could honestly say it stands up the best of the three in 2012. You know, I only just found out this year that Mega Man X3 was released on the PAL Super Nintendo, but I've sure as heck never seen a cartridge, except on eBay selling for ridiculous amounts. But in Australia, it was released on the PlayStation. And I'm happy to say it was the very first PlayStation game I ever bought. I got it before I even owned the console. The game itself is unchanged from the Super Nintendo original, but it's got some okay looking FMV sequences and the music was all redone. I've since heard the Super Nintendo version of the music, and it's awful. Really bad. 
The PlayStation version at least makes it sound a bit better, but it's still nowhere near the best of the Mega Man soundtracks. One thing that's funny is that on PlayStation, all of the different tunes are just audio tracks on the CD, so you can pop it in an ordinary CD player and play the soundtrack. I'm not sure why you'd want to, but you can. But because of this, when you're playing the game, the music will always get to a point, fade out, and then start again. So, is X3 just business as usual? There's the usual E-Tanks, Hearts, Dr. Light capsules. How many of these things did he hide? Seriously. There's no Street Fighter move this time, which is disappointing. You can still find a secret capsule towards the end of the game that'll turn X into a golden powerhouse, but it's just not the same. There's a pretty big change up to the gameplay in that this time you get to play as Zero. Unfortunately, it comes across as a bit half-hearted since you can only call him in for no more than a third of any given level. And once he dies, he's gone and can never come back, ever. It wasn't until X4 that Zero got a real starring role. The levels in X3 are larger than in the previous games, but that's not necessarily a good thing. I find the flow of the game feels a bit off because it takes that much longer to play through a level, and there's a lot more revisiting levels in this one as well. I do like the way each boss has its own FMV intro. But, hey, Auto? Does this confirm that a robot survived the Wily Wars and lives on in the future? Or are Capcom just having a laugh? Most likely the latter. Another thing that's a bit different this time around is that X collects different versions of the big metal walkers from previous games. I never really use them much, but they're there to collect for people who want them, and they can help you reach those unreachable places. So, on to the story. In X3, it became apparent that Capcom were really intending to make the series much more plot-driven. With a larger base of characters and an unfolding mystery that was uncovered a little bit more with each game, in this chapter there's a new robot scientist called Dr. Doppler who's invented a computer that neutralizes Maverick Reploids. After a couple of months of peace, all of Doppler's followers suddenly go Maverick and turn into a giant army. But why? Mega Man wonders. Meanwhile, Doppler's also managed to bring Vile back from the dead. No idea how. I'm pretty sure I destroyed him in Mega Man X1. At the same time, Zero apparently died. Mm. For a series that makes such a big deal of main characters dying, it's amazing how quickly they're recreated. Which makes sense, I suppose, because, you know, they're robots. Anyway, Doppler isn't a real villain, of course. He's just the front man trying to resurrect Sigma. Again. And resurrect him, he does. The final boss battle in Sigma's gigantic Kazer suit is one of the hardest boss battles in Mega Man history. Drives me crazy. I did manage to beat it this time, but this is only the second time I've actually completed Mega Man X3. And I'd accidentally let Zero die earlier, so I didn't get his ending. Blah. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Who are the chiefs in Dr. Doppler's army? Blast Hornet is found in some kind of an army base. He's the kind of boss that's ridiculously difficult if you don't have the right weapon, and ridiculously easy if you do. Blizzard Buffalo is usually the best one to start with. He's got a couple of essential pickups in his stage, and he's not too hard of a boss. Gravity Beetle is really heavy, and he can make black holes out of thin air. Hmm. His level is... Oh, I don't know, a warehouse or something? None of the locations are that imaginative in this game. Toxic Seahorse is made of liquid metal like the Terminator. Cool. Doesn't stop him from smashing into pieces when he gets hit by ice, though. Huh. He's in a dirty, filthy sewer. Bolt Catfish is the second sea creature on the list. He's in a big double tower of electricity, or something. Next is Crush Crawfish. Seriously? Another fish? Huh. In Australia, we call them crayfish, so to me, crawfish just sounds funny. Anyway, this guy's found down in the harbour. Watch out for his claws, they'll cut you in two. Tunnel Rhino is in a tunnel. Huh, how original. He's also got a drill for a horn. Yep, he sure does. Lucky last is the Neon Tiger, who's in some kind of jungle, which is sadly devoid of any neon. Oh well. I've got to say, all of the levels have a, a sameness about them. They are nowhere near as unique as the levels in X1 or X2. Capcom seems to have picked a handful of enemies and just repeated them through every level. This was something that happened a lot in the Mega Man Zero series as well, and I can't say I like it. There's only a small number of enemies that are exclusive to any one level, and it can begin to feel really repetitive after a while. Hey, remember how in X2 they had that fantastic energy spawning point that would let you fill up your sub-tanks really quickly? Well, no such luck here. 
The best place I could find was here in the Blizzard Buffalo stage. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep, it's a boring grind to fill up your sub tanks. Uh... Oh, and as you can see, the amazing C4 chip is back for some more completely underwhelming wireframe graphics. I really don't know why they bothered. Perhaps they had a whole warehouse of C4 chips they'd manufactured and just had to get rid of them. It's hard to put my finger on why exactly, but this game just feels different. I always thought that the level design wasn't as good as the first two games, and the bosses were generally fairly meh as well. There's also a lot more emphasis on collecting stuff, to the point where beating bosses and getting their weapons almost seems secondary. And there's a lot more time spent revisiting stage to get all the collectibles, which, well, sure, it pads out the gameplay time, but it also slows the momentum of the game down. It's also a harder and much less forgiving game than either X1 or X2. It was interesting to read on Wikipedia that Mega Man's creator, Inafune-san, had a lot less to do with this game than the previous ones, and he apparently felt psychological turmoil over letting outsiders create the game while he watched from a distance. I've got to say, it shows. I just don't think X3 is as good as its two prequels, and while it's still perfectly playable, I'm not going to say it stands simply because it's not up to the standards set by its predecessors. And that's the end of the Mega Man games in the 8 and 16-bit eras. 6 on the NES, 4 on the Super NES. I can't explain exactly why I'm so fond of the Mega Man games. I think it's the great characters, the tight gameplay, and the concept from the very first game of choosing your own path and adapting your abilities to suit your environment that still appeals as much today as it did back in 1987. See ya, Blue Bombers. Thanks for the memories. Well... The time has finally come. Next week, it's the last game in that ridiculously long list I made almost a year and a half ago. The Super Nintendo Swan Song, Terranigma, The Creation of Heaven and Earth. Peace out, everybody.